Dr. T. Tavo DRC, Tavo Teaching Center, Fort Mill, Charlotte region. We just hang out with God every day. We relate with God. We believe it's about a, a relationship and better to know about that part of Jesus Christ sooner than later and or later than sooner. So we believe that everybody can work on figuring out how to recreate or review what we really think and know about the Christ, what we know about the lost. After all, this is really about relationships. Once you get to heaven, it's a community. There's no fighting. There's no racism. Nobody's going to be destroying each other. It's just going to be great. But God wants us to get used to that and practice down here to give him glory, to give him honor, and to show the world, the Christian community, his heart. I would take a big peek at a couple of things. One is Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4 is written in a method that says all the different offices, mature offices in the church, are to know the same thing, about the same thing. They'll have different temperaments, different views, but there's basically four common doctrine that the church needs to know and cement. That is a sign of a real Christian. All the other things are valid and real and true, but the Lord says he, you know, it implies he knows there'll be a lot of differences in perspectives. You know, our Lord could be coming soon. He could be coming later, or we could be going to see him soon. We don't know the day or the hour we go, but we want to keep on, you know, I feel joyful at peace, but I'm still, the time is a perspective about who is really prepared to go to meet with the Lord and be there on the final day. And who is not, and I mean Christians. Anybody else, we're open to, you know, we're hope, hoping you'll know, but the Christian right now has been in my concern the last few years. God has put that on my heart. Certain kinds, really everybody. So the idea is that who and what and why and where is Jesus, the church, and ministry. The other day I started teaching on Isaiah 61 the portrait of the Christ, the Messiah, in a ministry form, but it's also a portrait of ministry for you and myself in these days. Now, we know we get worn out. We know we get battle fatigue. We know we get the cares of the world, so that's part of it. But he says there are different hallmarks, different portraits of the snapshot of the Christ that we should rehearse to ourselves, review, and remind ourselves that he doesn't always appear in the same way and method every time that gets stale. So if you want to say the last 80s move on up has sort of gotten a picture, especially the TV affected media kind, it's gotten a picture that Christ, the portrait is Christ is a Solomon. He rules. He gets his stuff. He gets the queens. He gets all these things he wants and needs because that's what they see and that portrait is that is a sign of God's dominion, authority, all these good things. Well, truly that is there, and that is right, at seasons, if he wants it. But I think that has gone way, way past that. And it's more like nobody even knows the real part, real Christ. You know a form. See, that's it. A form is one thing, but then in a form, a system... A culture of forms, not relationships, you get Phariseeism, you get accusation, and also mean, status conscious, elite, you know, our system against yours, our famous Apollos versus Paul, all those types of things which we now deal with. Add to that the cult following and the occult, the superior heightened alertness of occult, not Holy Spirit, and fame. <laughs> You know, nobody knew, none of us knew that we'd have the fame and media and the packaging, you know, Instagram and all that. We're not against that. We're just saying, be careful that we don't forget and omit what is organic before all this happened. Organic in food, organic in ministry is without any synthetic human additives. And only you and I, you know, will, only you and I will know in part Nobody will see themselves or be able to figure it out, but we can grow. We need to grow. I would suggest, with all the repeated scuffling and fighting and, you know, accusing of ministries toward non-Christians or subcultures or lifestyles or each other, 
each other, including I've been around, you know, seen it, then I think we need to work on this. Many people are saying now, many people are saying, oh, we need to change the Bible to feed, so it won't hurt anybody's feelings. You know, we want to change it to please everybody in the subculture. Let's change it. No, 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 no. That is very, very sober and off, very errant. Instead, I suggest we change us. This is my point. Crossbody Unity believes you, first we change us and our methods, the methodology of the old tent, the old whatever it was, is not the same. People and society have changed, and they are changing. There are all kinds of different people in our culture that were never there, all the different types of faith from other nations, all right? So we have to have a global approach and a simple approach that we respect people <laughs> and we're not shocked or easily whatever you're not biased or bigoted or horrified if they don't believe just like you or live differently you have to know this that everybody is human people are people but they have a backstory and they have a tribe they may have a different experience that is so bad you would never guess it but people have all sorts of experiences as well as hard knocks with Christians and there are a lot of Christians when I was in Dallas years ago I don't think they would know this but you know people would know that I'm talking about all right I went to the spa I went to the spa and I was able to take all you know had a good time and and so the female that was the hostess at the spa was from England UK and she was in her probably a 40s you know her mother and so we were talking and uh, I'd had some, you know, the subculture was good at many parts. I like McKinney, but I'd had some, as an expat and a leader, I had a lot of subculture that was like different than I'd ever seen. The, the residual always had been there all their days. You know, that's the part. <laughs> so we were talking and she said this. She said this. You know, she, she said, I'm from England. I said, how are you fitting in? You're, you're new. I'm new. How are you fitting in? Well, I'm not. She says, I'm from England, and we don't believe anything. We don't go to church. We, you know, we're like New Age. We don't really go to church. So we moved over here, happy. <laughs> and my neighbor, my new neighbor, came out to greet me. And she said, oh, we're so glad you're here. What church do you go to? And she said, very happily, we don't go to church. The lady changed and turned and walked away and never spoke to her again. That spirit is what I was I met. That type of spirit. So it that is called what is it? Immune. Indifferent just word curse theology. You're evil because you're not like me. That is embedded in the subculture of the giantest population of Christian ministry and folk that say they're purposely born again <laughs> believe the Bible and I'm sure they're not all white but these have been a lot of them I don't know if the majority is white or not but they're all well meaning I will say this because I deal with all people I had a <laughs> and I've had bo I, I deal with a lot of cultures and I know the black women have said things you know nobody's perfect so I did have a friend an older friend out in Dallas and the friend was a white female very attractive older lady with white hair very dainty like a hundred pounds and she was very sophisticated but a spirit-filled believer and her church she went to in Dallas outside you know the area re region her pastor she was white but her pastor was from Africa gets along you know like me so she had two relatives the sister and her husband were both ill very ill so she would leave her home and live with them for a while to nurse them and so she was nursing them with cancer and she needed a break over in their area so she goes out she says I'm gonna to go to church I need a break so she went over and she saw a black church so she went over to the black church she was getting out very white dainty little lady and she got out and the deacon came over and said I'm sorry this is for black people only <laughs> When I heard that, I went, ah, oh, I feel encouraged. No, really, I really, I only, I've only dealt with, you know, certain kind of white folk charismatic that were really a big deal, a trial, at the as a new newbie or expat experienced minister. 
And so when I heard that, I thought, thank you. I mean, I can balance it up with a little bit of everybody's got something somewhere, pockets. Now, that's the issue. Nobody's got it all. Nobody should be the king or the queen over everybody. You're not the king. You are sent to be overseer. That means, as I say, we're an overseer. I'm repackaging it. The way I've seen it done, patriarchy, we're the overseers. Like the slave drivers, some of these. We own you like property, <laughs> woman or anybody. So with that in mind, no, no, no. That really gave me pause to reteach it. And I think of this as a prophet seer type. All right. I am an over perceiver seer. That means I'll, if you want prayer, if you want a governmental office that is mature to be your pastor, let's say loosely, or speak into your life or watch you in prayer, you know, I'm an over perceiver seer, an over perceiver seer, overseer, but I'm doing it in the spirit. I'll be, you know, if you're on my heart, God put you in my heart. I'll pray for you. I will not pray against you, but I'll do things that is like watching your back. That's really what it is. So I can do that if you want that fellow Christian, fellow leader. The issue is with the Levitical patriarch, I think it's an ancient spirit. <laughs> I really do. An ancient, wearying spirit. Because I have thought that I'd never met it or grown up around it. So I've evaluated from tons of angles. I even went back and I thought, now I have no German in me. It's got a Teutonic. It seems to all these people have a Teutonic flair or something. So I study now, is there historically, because all the prophets, they like to go back, what is the root, the subculture, where does the, you know, the root, the prophetic root, and so I understand it. And so I thought, now let me ask you, and, the, and you know, with enmity, invisible, no need, but it triggers enmity, so there's something about my personality or my demeanor or my DNA, spiritual or otherwise, I'm a prophet, pastor, and apostle. But I am a female, too, which is not their forte. Now, I thought, here I am, French Huguenot, English, no German. But when I go into where they have the LP, it's usually got a Germanic flavor, flair, a little more control. And I'm not, I'm a more of a wing, I mean, I am logical and normal, I can do that way, but I'm also... I can hear real fast and move, you know, different directions. I've got a lot I can do. So when I went there and I thought this troubles that spirit, why? So I even went back to the nationalities. I even, because some of them do this type of thing. Hey, I'm submitting it Sela, not an autocratic dogma. I thought I'm going to see if there was an enmity between the French and the Germans way back when in the natural, you know, natural nation. And there was. <laughs> and then I do have French Huguenot on me and in uh, Cordsville, South Carolina and Monk's Corner, same thing. There is a Tevo church, uh, which was planted. It's a historical landmark, but that's to let people know there's something in the bloodline. You can't help it, you know, but you don't want to do it unless it's God. And I never do anything just to do it. I have to wait. I want to wait. I respect God enough to wait. He says, this is what you're supposed to do. How you're supposed to, This is who you are and not. So we want to help you. If you are still in that process of figuring out who you are or not, we'll be glad to chat with you or, you know, as long as you're not dysfunctional. Right now, I'll tell people if they're in these movements that read me, I know you're reading me and it really is wrong. And I will read you back and say, nope, that bugs me. It's in. It is such a. It is such a group that are so. Is it word and privileged that they don't need to respect you or love you as a real human? They've forgotten. It's a character issue. So I'm mentioning it. Jesus went about doing good, healing all those who are oppressed by the devil. Acts ten twenty eight. And the Lord was with him. But he related. He didn't malign and he did not target and he did not I'm going to sit there because I'm the savior I don't need to know you I'm just going to read you and see if you've got a thirst you're coming to take me down yeah that is just what is that like it's a click 
but it's so strange. It's, it's sick. It's a false religion spirit. It's a it's something wrong. It's false. I'm not calling the whole group false. You can have both fi mixture, and that's the issue. It's so confusing. Who is a true prophet and who is not? Who is occult? What is psychic? What is Holy Spirit? And we've just been on the journey. We can tell a lot of it. So, when I have, you know, I was not brought up to do this or to think like this. I was brought up that a normal, my parents were happily married, educated. He went to seminary when I was first born and graduated Louisville Theological Seminary Baptist. My mother was a um, getting her master's degree in English and had me, I don't know if she finished it, but she was smart. And I remember just pleasant things. No dad was head of the home. You don't think male or female, you know, you think chain of command. I do remember that from the beginning, I liked teddy bears instead of dolls. That's all I can think. I used to read pirate books over and over and over the unwilling, you know, because I like adventure. I just didn't know. But I was always brought up that the father is the head of the home. Not a big deal. I saw it reflected in my family of gentlemen and ladies who Bible scholars usually and the men in business. So it was like natural. No one thinks, don't thou shalt not, woman. I was a girl. But I was not the kind that, and I'm still not, that like pastel pink. I never liked Barbies. I don't know why. I just have adventure, and I have a man's ministry, a human's ministry, and I relate. Let me say this. I've always gotten along better with human persons that are men until God started to bring forth warrior women. Long story. All my life, I just hit it off. Second grade, I just think like, I think, I don't know what it is. I don't think floozy or anything. I think like guys. And I also am a woman and female and all that. And I, it takes somebody who's, I guess, not a weak person to make me feel like they're the, you know, like a Lapidoth and Deborah. So you can't, this is what I'm getting to. Where I've been on my journey, there are many people who have no problem with me or no problem with women, leader women. And then you meet subcultures. They're all around you thick that, wow, who raised these people? What do they think women are? What do they think they are for? And they're Christians. That's what I found in the deep Southwest and also in the celebrity subculture of certain kinds, not all. When I was down there, I remember in DFW, whoa, learning curve, I think of myself as a person, as a human. I think you're a human. I think Christians are human. Yeah, I notice you're male, female, black, white, but you're human. I relate to you with respect, equally, and value. If you're married, you lead the woman, you know. If you're married, I'm very careful. I don't hang out with you, but I, I'm going to make sure if I even speak to you on a regular basis that you're faithful to the wife and I watch out for the wife and the man I've never I had good parenting I had good teaching and modeling you know you can teach but unless you model it if you're slipping around or doing things you shouldn't as a man no I he lived it so I have a you know I have a real witness of what a standard is now you can ask me questions if you have any concern about my anything but because I had people that I first discovered slippery, sly, low character, witch watching ministry. I didn't know. I was not prepared. I didn't know you had to be under them. I didn't know a woman whose husband is there watching the children says, You have my, and, and they're teammates. They're skilled people. You're smart. You've been a history of ministry, pastoring, but you don't have any fame or you're not as old or as craggy and steeped in their type of doctrine. So my lesson from it is I was raised denominational, democracy, everybody's equal, everybody's equal in races, but you don't have to be under anybody. There's no thing is that. You just... God wants you to go to church, yes, but there's no one watching you and monitoring you in the area at large that you are not under, you're not submitted. That's exactly what we found. I had never been. So no one caught me. I didn't know the rules. 
they jumped me. I had, I literally got harassed by these people. I got repeatedly harassed, and so did many other. I met 30 women and one man while I was there, when I first, demonic. So you can say, yes, it's demonic, and yes, it's old-timey law somewhere back in the hills. That's all I can think, and I was not raised. When I was led by the Spirit, we lived in the city of Richmond. We lived in the, you know, it was with all colors, and uh, suburban urban ministry has been me. So I moved out where it's a different location, and that is where I found a different subculture that I was ever around that I didn't know I found that sort of picked one out and watched or everybody, you know. So let me say this. The bottom line, I believe it is shepherding movement, which is charismatic old country law from the deep south. Later on, when they're divining you, targeting you, saying you're all the sorts of this with a cult, they're witchcraft. But that is, I think, like the New England whelp up in the... Uh, Salem witch trials, who use spectral evidence to the vibe, it's a witch, cause, but I also think, because the spectral evidence is maybe different from that, it's still false and occult and witch watching. I believe it also goes back, in my mind, to the theological good old persons up in the hardcore country Mountain Hill, Mountain Williams School of Theology, who used to see Jezebels, harlots, uh, little women and we're hard scrabble, you know, but Bible believe it. I believe that culture because I mentioned before I have an elder gentleman that we chat uh, music, my friend at one of the Starbucks uh, Paneras, and so he and I chat and he's the kind of Baptist that I can't remember what it is, but it's, they don't have music alright and he's very happily married and the men lead and I, I love that, that's the way it should be most, you know, most of the time, unless you need, you're desperate, and that's why God's calling us out sometimes, women. But um, we're for the men to do it. And I have other things I'll talk, because I you have know, proven that God has said to do this, release on that, but I don't want to take that time. So we were talking, and we were talking about his background, and he's older, young acting, but older. So he said they don't have music in their church, they have the, you know, They'll lead by, you know, a cappella. And that years, decades ago, he grew up in the mountains of Tennessee, something like that. The mountains of Tennessee. And that in the area where it was back in the hills in Tennessee, he's probably 80 some, that people had superstitions and would say they had apparitions or people, figures appear, you know, people hear that and witches and stuff like that. Now, doesn't that sound like Americana? It really does. Folk art, all that stuff. That's what happens in human, you know, different realms. So it is my thought when I look at logically think, where does this subculture embedded, enduring subculture, and the ones I'm talking about are all white, where do they get this? And that would be everybody's thought to say where, but I'm going to give you my thought, and that is false religion, occult, and then little g gods. I think it ties in with my word to these and the United States, Isaiah 1 through 10. It said that in Isaiah 520, uh, the people were a woe. The leaders of God were in, in the nation in sin, God's people, and God said they are woe. They call good evil, evil good. That means they couldn't tell an Elijah from which sitting in the audience. My exact finding. Around the nation. One kind. He said why. Isaiah the national prophet said in Isaiah 1 through 3. The three things that were going on. God's people. His leaders in Isaiah. God's people. Not the foreign nations. Were guilty of little g gods. False gods. They were guilty of false religion, mind reading, divining. That's my opinion. They were guilty of vanity. We are the world. Nobody can teach me anything. I've lived it in my family. You know, we're all the, we are it. Or, oh, I'm so gifted. Our, you know, we, we can read your mind. Oh, we, you know, we're the special gift. Is this celebrity or is it Christ following? 
To make a long story short, I've determined to teach organic, to ask everyone to think. Let's try to figure out who and what is Christian ministry, and am I real? You, All of us are on the, you know, nobody's going to arrive. Only Christ was the only organic, true prophet, selfless, character, morally, physically, financially. He was the only pure one. All of us are suffering. All of us got to grow, and some are worse than others. And some are better. I mean, they have less faults. So the goal is that you and the Lord and your Bible must be on guard. And then you determine with God and maybe another person and the Bible, how much faults can I take in my spirit? Or how much should I before I really get out? So that is what I talked to the Lord three or four years ago about. How do you say this? If everybody's got something off, everybody, male or female, then what do I tell people about false prophets? Because that is the trend. It's always been the trend to find, you know, they don't believe like I do, so they're false. I've never talked to them to find out. And that's now on TV, you know, media as well. So the idea is all the ball is in your court and mine, and I try to do it myself. Who is true? Who is false? You have to evaluate assess repeatedly but don't accuse them don't word curse them all right so let's go back to start from a core kernel beginning to determine organic according to first church it would not be the law it would not be licentious it would not be blaming it would not be murderous or territorial i don't find that in the church it was the opposite it was a community house to house so I would say, let us begin with the biggest voice in Christian ministry, and that's Christ. I would read Christ in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John when he was alive, preaching the gospel, living it, being it, with his disciples, apostles, for mentoring, and then also, by example, healing and relating. So we would go through, this is my call right now, is to say, with all the fanfare, rules, and stuff going on, let's go back by ourselves, get your Bible out, and read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and look at Jesus' actions and reactions in every relationship mentioned, and then we act like him. That will cut the chaff, a lot of it, and dysfunction. So Jesus Christ related, but you got to see how he did it with ladies and fallen women and his mother. And with little children and Roman centurions and Judas and all sorts of things. You can't name them all. This is the way a minister would act and comport themselves. And you would train it that way. We're looking for who and what is real and authentic in portraying Christ in ministry, leadership, family, and real life. All right. So the biggest voice is Paul. I mean, the biggest voice is Jesus. And you notice, was he under the law? Was he a finger pointer? I also point out in Hebrews about the Christ to the prophets that in Hebrews 1 and 2 and 9, it's a key factor, a key point to be made if you say you're a prophet, if you witness that you're the prophet, all right? Because we're watching these. <laughs> uh, we prefer perceiver discerner, but office prophet is a Bible term, all right? So in Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, the writer says that in the old days, the old days, Old Testament, God spoke in diverse manners to his people by the prophets. So the Old Testament prophets were different in the fact they were craggier, more finger pointing, more doom and gloom, you know, which is because no one could have the Holy Spirit in their heart to teach them or guide them or convict them back then. Only a few people, the prophets, had the Holy Spirit given to them to give that word, the oracle word of the Lord, to the land. Okay. Sometime through the years, I've heard people that have, that are really, their people are the ones that really use the witchcraft, spying and not speaking. I've heard some of their teaching, and they say, they had books written by some of the top ones that said, yeah, the prophet is craggy and moody, and, you know, it's because they're so so into the Lord and getting the word. You know, it gave them pass for being mean and grouchy. No, no, no. Why? I have the simple answer, Hebrews 1 and 2. And it says today that in those days God spoke through the craggier prophets, 
grouchy and moody and not friendly or relating. <laughs> the oracle back then. It said, yes, he spoke into various words. But in these days, Hebrews 1, 2 says, now Jesus speaks through, through his son, Jesus. So his son, the office prophet, Messiah of all times. All right. We look at Jesus, regard him in his relationships, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, his character, his nature, in his office, demeanor. Also, I would caution people when I deal with occult mind readers and diviners. Do you see that in the New Testament or the old about the Christ or anybody? No. Isaiah 11, 2 and 3, another portrait of the Christ, the Messiah says, Jesus would come, the, you know, the Messiah would come with all of God's seven spirits, the spirit of uh, counsel, wisdom, might, holy fear of the Lord, spirit of the Lord, okay, not divining, not mind reading. He came with the power, like the book of Acts, all right, imbued with power, but no ego. With all that power, it said that the Messiah, Christ, would delight himself, Isaiah 11, 3, delight himself in the fear of the Lord, and all of that would make him sharp of discernment. And he would not judge by the sight of his eyes. He would not accuse or judge, jump to conclusions, knee-jerk reactions, you know, do all this stuff. I saw him as a type. She's divorced. He's divorced. They're out of order. They're a church hopper. He wouldn't do that. But you would. You would. And you do. He would not. These, it is written, said, Christ, our role model for now, would not judge by the sight of his eyes. He would not make decisions based on what he heard. He wouldn't believe the evil report. He wouldn't let gossip into his ears. He'd forbid it, and he would train his ministers to do the same. Why? Because he's a savior, not a two-faced pretender. He is a savior. He is trustworthy. That's it. You can't trust if you can't, if they don't respect. You can't trust a leadership. You can't trust a pastor, a leader, their leg. You can't trust a friend if they are not emotionally honest, not healthy, not respectful of you. It's a character issue. So we can trust Jesus. He's honest. Uh, I don't think we can trust some of his people, but hopefully you can find some. So we look at our role models in the snapshots of the Christ. He was not an accuser. He, wasn't, he was the Messiah. Last, for that part, another missing portrait that he's, there, he wasn't always a Solomon <laughs> like everybody thinks he is. All right, Jesus Christ in Isaiah 53, the suffering servant. All right, he, it says he is still rejected because he took all of our iniquities and our pain and suffering, our grief by his stripes. We are healed. We still are healed. We can receive that. Big and lengthy. I don't have the Bible out tonight. Read it later. We'll talk on that one another time. So we got a lot of mysteries going on. We got a lot of mysterious things. What is ministry? Who is a ministry? How do I tell? Uh, do they fault find me by a look, appearance, vibe? Is that really a true prophet? So the number of true prophets could be very limited, if any of us are, because always somebody's got something. But then we have to take a limit of how much, you know, you've got to have, you have to go after and let God reveal to you and clarify who he wants you to speak into your life, who he wants you to sit under, and what kind of governing authority. When I have discussed, taught, read, and pondered, how to talk about who is a false prophet. What is a false prophet, false teacher, false apostle, etc. And you don't want to be one. I don't either. But there's so much of that. That is so popular, so easy, so, uh, oh yeah, we're, we're so cool and so such big shots in God's eyes in the ministry that we can now, everybody's a false prophet except us. <laughs> I lived around it in little teeny ministries and I noticed the proclivity, the profound proclivity and ponderance of plenitude 
of naming everybody false prophets. These were charismatic, you know, different kind. So we're not of that, but we are, we're ongoing having to deal with that dysfunction, especially online. All right, I wanted to get to this and submit it. When you see me, you see a earth-suited, handcrafted, tailor-made earth suit of a female. White, Western European background, ancestry, but not a well, not a Levitical matriarch. A maven, a connoisseur of doctrine. Okay. Yet we resemble it. And you can resemble things that you're not either. And so we're trying to teach it, but also that when we show up, that we are not a threatening stereotype to these leaders. It's very fatiguing. It is very and sad for other women that go through it, and men. All right. So decades of study has given me this pointers and reproving. So when I go out and I am here teaching, or if I have a meeting, or I work on teaching or theology, it's me. I'm a human's ministry. I'm not trying to displace a man. I'm not trying to... T I never wanted to do that. I never cared. I did whatever God wanted. My daddy was the head of the home. I thought that's... I didn't feel as feminine to be a pastor. But I had many things that showed me through the years that a lot of men were beaten up by male authority or pastors or word cursed by their daddies, their stepfathers and the preachers. And that many were raised in this generation without any father, and they have they respect women, white women and black. So I happen to be, you know, by divine appointment, they'd come across my path, and I'd find myself talking to six foot three guys, and they were telling me their stuff, and I went, wow. But I understand because I really, genuinely respect men, and I tr I don't have an issue with men. If people think I do. It's because they're the mind readers. <laughs> you would have to know. I mean, people that I meet all the time, I deal with people equally, very respectful, males and females. And I want the men to lead. So we have met our share of good people, quality people. But when after the 90s started to really turn into fantasy, playland, prosperity, getting harder, you know, off, and people just running with all sorts of doctrine about authority, the authority and the witchcraft grew. And then the cult, clan, cliques, tribes. Now, I was looking and mentioning, when you see a woman, you know, it doesn't matter what you think personally. I don't really care. I'm going to do what God says. I don't have anything except what God says if and when, if God ever sends me somebody that's a lapidoth for this Deborah, that is, you know, if he's, throw somebody and he sends them and it's the right person. They know it. I know it. That is where I'll be. Chain of command Ephesians 521 and 522. Then I'll have the head of the home and I will talk it over what I do and we'll negotiate what he, but we planned. We're mature. We're not stupid. It's the people who've never lived like this or had any kind of growth except their own experience back in the embedded subculture of what a wannabeism People come in all sizes, shapes, styles, evil, not evil. You have to have respect and a modicum of discernment and a little bit of give, grace, to think, oh, they're not like I've ever met or wanted to meet. No, you got to learn now. We're in a new area, a new day. People are moving in from all over the world. I picture where I used to go and visit before all the sophistication I used to go be led up and down North Carolina, Virginia, where I was in all kinds, but then I'd be led on certain adventures to little black churches, speak in black churches, speak in white churches. I went to many that were under 100, under 200, some 35, you know, because you go to all kinds. Every time I'm watching, feeling fine, doesn't matter to me, but I, you can't help but notice the different preferences the cultures and the respect and I never had any any weird stuff distancing disrespect evil eye hardball in the African American I even oversaw in the 90s a spirit filled uh, Vietnamese church the pastor died I was friends with his wife she said would you and another pastor take turns for a year and a half overseeing the church speaking and also loving it 
So we are quality. And I learn from, I admire all of these people. They teach me when I'm there. I'm looking, but I also love to see what the good things they're doing. When I think of these people back then, back then they're probably more rural, poor country area, some of these. And then I think of bigger groups that were out like in a campground and they were surrounded by more land, you know, different things I've come across through the years. America was like that. America is like that. But America is also, everybody wants to buy the property near these places. So this is why we're teaching to say, America used to have this standard, I guess, of the white colonial men, the white colonial groups, the Christians were those. And they are. But you got to say you're not the only ones. And you, you're not the only way, the truth, and the life. Some white people don't, you don't have to teach them like this. This group, the subculture of hardness, you do. Because they've gotten, I don't know, inbred, shallow, deep in their own Kool-Aid, whatever. Uh, so we're trying to help them get ready for a revival. All right. So I picture I can handle small. I can handle it. I don't care. We are looking for Holy Spirit, you know, the true people, to help them. So I can go and say, uh-oh, that culture's here. What are those people coming from? The Middle East, Asia, Africa. Europe. What are those people going to find when they come here? And these people are like hard and suspicious. Turf owning and narrow. Yeah, you know, they're coming in here again. Take our stuff and our turf. Yeah, we know the Bible. Let's go convert them. Let's go. <laughs> no, you respect them. I'm giving you lessons that I learned the hard way from being the expat, the newbie. I would like to say on the good side of this, just think, you have been waiting, you thought you were too far in the woods, too far up the mountain, too far in the hiding hole of life, that God could bring you many people to have in your ministry, to be there for you, to love on them and respect them and show them the love of God, the joy of God. You didn't know, but now they're all coming over where you live, and you better be careful because they're building condos. They're building mansions. They're building million-dollar farms. But you are still there, and you've always been, so you're not used to it. You've got to get used to a different culture than your kind. And if you are, quote, sin conscious, and somebody comes in that is not stupid and has their own bias toward you or their own faith that is the opposite, you're going to have to be ready in a how to deal with it nicely. Also, if they are of a lifestyle that you don't like, all right, you got to get ready how to hand, you got to get ready with no fear that they're humans, that these are people that went through stuff like you have, but in a different way. You have a lot of teaching of your methodology and your tone and respect and no fear. So I don't want to go into that right now, but I really am an in-depth scholar, uh, experienced of theology, of trying to really, our demeanor is so important, people read us. People have been through worse than you would ever think before they got here, and they may be smiling. So if you have no empathy, if you have no, if you're a coward, if you're up the creek bias, you know, they will know. So that's where we're saying it. Last of all, I do have, I realize I have deposits of a lot of good leadership and worship people, a lot of people. But there's some people that I would be saying, Let, come on over and I'm going to introduce you to the nation to, through this ministry, but I couldn't do it. You know why? They weren't true. They were not, they were not fair. They were they were accusing me, but they never would speak to me and confront me. They went over there and minimized, they did things that were treacherous and not, and bad. And if they'd come to me, they would have not, they would have known my heart, my character. I knew, generate, you know, like 30 years ago, that'd be coming forward. 
for the body for the name of the Lord. I knew I'd be coming for it and wanted to feature people along the way. I thought, now that's one, that's one, she's one, he's one. I could later on help their ministry. But no, God will not let me. There's one person where I used to live before Dallas, one female. I don't know if she's alive or not, but I'm open to that one. That is it. I would not be here today had I not been lied about and you know, betrayed by people with false doctrine and false authority. So that's the point. When we're teaching of true and false and diverse, it is not just what I thought. I thought false prophets. I thought false preachers, false apostles, all that, were Bible faults. They didn't know Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life. That's still a to retain. I thought it was in the Bible. That's one side. It is two sides. And I'm not saying it's worse on the second side. Authority. False authority. But there is a scripture that I do not minimize that is on my heart. And that is Matthew 7, 21, 23. Jesus rebuke to the ministers who use false authority. And he said, many of you, many Think of when this was written, how many thousands and hundreds of thousands, possibly. It says, many of you, gifted and shining, many of you would say, Lord, Lord, didn't I do all these things in your name? Such as the book of Acts things. He mentions books of Acts specifically. Didn't I do all these things in your name? Lord, Lord, I prophesied in your name. I did casting out devils in your name. I did signs and wonders in your name and... He says, depart from me. I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness, which means iniquity, which means Strong's Bible Concordance, false authority. When I look at who's run me roughshod in my thorough life <laughs> and live to talk about it, it is what I would warn you. God let me, God let me go through, you know, he purified me, but he also woke me up to what, wow, the dangerous it is for this new move and you he said read Psalm 144 that is David's Psalm it says beware the strange children read it the whole thing is about the, the strange children keep your children away from the strange children you will not prosper if you stay if you if you um, deal with the strange children and that's true alright Psalm 144, the strange children, has two verses that repeat themselves. It is 7 and 11, like the store, 7 and 11. It says, the, the, um, the strange children, they have mouths that speak vanity and the right hand of falsehood twice. Mouths that speak vanity and the right hand, which stands for authority, uh, that speak falsehood. And the right hand of uh, uh, falsehood excuse me, the right hand of falsehood. So what is a mouth that speaks vanity? That means they're speaking things that won't count on the final day when you're standing alone before the Lord. All right? And there are things we need now that are, you know, good for us, uh, you know, that make us have a healthy life, happy, well-rounded, prosperous life, you know, good life. But these are taking us into the wrong, the wrong vein of, proper priorities and we may get off into frivolity too much have been to my building of our own kingdom the demas and then think it's all about us oh yeah we're the big boss oh yeah it's us you know anybody else like the poor person or the stranger the alien the maverick oh yeah 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 they're just don't pass our test and we're christians saying we have a church that's what we got all right right hand of falsehood think on it Let's do the right hand of falsehood. False authority. You said, but Lord, I prophesied. I cast out devils. I did all, I, I had great authority. I had great teaching. Out from me. You never knew me. Falsehood and the right hand of falsehood is false authority. It could be pressure, cult spirit, mesmerizing uh, 
divining, subliminal targeting underneath praying against. Um, being, make, making people afraid, pressure, afraid of being in sin. Yeah, we're going to shun you. You're not giving enough money. We're going to hold you hostage. And you got to sit there until somebody coughs it up. $500 each. <laughs> That's false authority. And more. Much more. So only you can do it. So I teach from a, a vantage point of experience, but also being a human. And it happened to be sent like this. Even though you're a person who is a woman. But I never, I've never thought... I, I'm a female when I'm with a, you know, if I'm married or something. I, I enjoy that. I love being a mom and I like being myself and a girl. But I don't like the caste system and I don't like the minimizing and the pressure that you are watching. We're watching you because you're our property and you're nothing but a, you can't handle it. And that is just out there. And I learned it. I lived it to think, wow, I didn't know. I had people that were like, Everybody's got their authority, you know. And when I moved out to the deep southwest, I had a couple I knew, and he was like a bantam, feisty rooster. You know, you're under me. You're the weaker vessel. <laughs> I'm from the East Coast. I'm sorry, I've been around, but it's like they never left their 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 nice up their upbringing, and so everybody down there, it seemed like everybody seemed that the woman was their turf. Everyone seemed in the charismatic movement that it was the weaker vessel, but also the stupider vessel and the easily led prey vessel, which I did not like at all and found it disgusting. Now, when I was going to different ones that were not technically charismatic prophetic, the faith movement is nobody's perfect. And at the bottom, there's some things, but the top, I felt so they're, they're equal. The faith movement, you know, word of faith does is out there big time. And they were not like that in this property, at least what I thought the big ones. Now, I don't know about the little ones, but I'm not in that movement, but I did visit and I enjoy the good qualities through the years. I have favor, they have favor with me if I'm, you know, I don't go into building my kingdom or, uh, we understand people have taken a lot of these movements, including especially that one and taken it and used it for themselves. And now it's called the prosperity movement, but I was there before. I call it word of faith. I have my part to teach from that, calling it abiding faith, which is not materialism or greed, but very careful. And yet you've got to have money to have peace on earth and your family and to grow and whatever God says. But that's another time. So I want to say that we caught a lot of good things, impartations and you know, the anointing, the worship, the moving in the gifts, healing, you know, and I learned healing when we need it, if we teach it very carefully. But I'm not a strict church attender. I'm not a joiner. I do not. After what I've been through, after what I've suffered, I, I do not want to be owned by people who know less, who are not pure hearted. And though some of them are pure hearted and greater than me, I do not want to be micro managed by their people who are under them. I found out that it does make a difference, your age, how much the group that says they're leaders that are even 10 years younger than myself are much more into their status, their gifts, their money. It's not, nobody, they just grew up like that. We got to remedy that. So I'm from the old, I guess I'm not old fashioned. I'm very current, in fact, more modern than most people. I think really young always. But I find that the amount of, quote, prosperity teaching where people are more the demon, you know, concerned about their status or their money or their stuff is really a lot different, even just a few years younger, because they were brought up like that. Now I can't imagine nobody who's never seen, had no media, no packaging of preachers, <laughs> no internet, no sign of normal they can't help it but we got to be here to you know give a new definition of help them out when they want it for relationships and i'm not saying they i mean there's so many people that know this of all ages i'm not saying that but when i meet people in a visitor newbie sense and there are more than a few time after time you know there's something that needs to be 
added or worked on. Um, I'm pro the doctrine of many people that look like they're, you know, they're famous. I'm pro because I read it myself, and a lot of people are maligned or people that have been judged, and people have taken their doctrine and run with it, materialism or stuff. But we're going to see one day at a time, one case at a time. I'm pro black skin, dark skin, human skin, natural people, charismatics, Catholics. I'm looking at you like Paul. I'm trying to look like Paul. I'm trying to determine, sift through the stuff. Paul said, I'm determined not to know anything about anybody except Christ and him crucified. That's what counts. It's not Demas. We need that right now. It helps you with racism, bias, targeting, a lot of things. It shows that we're, you respect a human. You can have compassion, empathy like a real human, like Jesus. You can. That's what we need. We're, we have to do that. <laughs> we have to work on it, certain people. So this is not my day, not your day, but it is a new day, and it's God's day, and we'll be with him. Let me know if you have any questions, and I'll give you my phone, which is a voicemail. And if you leave a voicemail, if I don't witness to my spirit or my friend, you know, my helper doesn't, we will not call you back. I'm being honest. And also, I'll give you the Gmail that you can do the same thing. So we are pro divine appointments, but we're very select. We have to be careful because there's a lot of game playing out there. All right, the phone number to have the voicemail is eight zero three seven nine two seven zero seven zero eight zero three seven nine two seven zero seven zero. The, e the email is crossbodyunity at gmail.com. Crossbodyunity. All right. So this is Tavo, Sister Tavo, formerly TJ DRC back in the old, you know, day before all this riotous stuff that was discovered. So I'm saying that because it was so fun then, more fun. More fun as a leader, more fun as a visitor, you know, just knowing the body. So I believe we're in that new, and I'm in an area similar to that, so it's quality. Anyway, let's look upon God's goodness, not on each other. Let's look upon God's goodness, not on our faults, our differences, and try to be that new day in Christ. God bless you. He loves you. You know, I don't see turf protecting in the Bible. Spiritual turf protecting. I see Holy Spirit good training, leadership training, lay, training people to have self government, read boundaries, discern the body of Christ correctly, holy fear of the Lord, humility, which is the beginning of wisdom, uh, having their iron sharpens iron, having times of knowing God's purpose. And Paul is the second voice in the New Testament, in my opinion. He writes two-thirds of the New Testament, and he writes community, which is not respected. That's not a teaching that is respected now because it is not valued. It has no money associated with it, seemingly. So we will keep on giving you our our point of view, a submitted sila, and you take what you feel is hay, spit out the stubble, and keep what you do and add it to or mix it in or add improve upon it for your own ministry. God bless you. This is Tevo. Bye-bye.